My name is Rod McCurdy, originally from Alabama, now living in Melbourne, Australia. In 2003, I was part of a reed ship expedition sailing from Chile to Easter Island to help demonstrate that people from South America could have used an ancient craft to uh, migrate into Polynesia. Um, this particular um, uh, adventure that I'd like to talk about is one that I literally stumbled across in 2000. So, and this is a backpacking trip through South America. I came across a gentleman who had an aspiration to build a reed ship and to sell it uh, following in the footsteps of Tor Hardall, showing the migration theories of people moving from South America into Polynesia, and he wanted to use a reed ship. So uh, this is the boat that we took three years to raise the funds to start planning and, and then ultimately to uh, set sail in March of uh, 2003. And I have to say that when I did stumble across uh, Phil, um, as soon as he talked about it, I was like, I'm in. I mean, I, I, all I kept thinking about is how do I finagle away on this boat? And so I just kept sucking up, sucking up. So if anybody, I am planning another one. So if anybody wants to suck up, you can do so afterwards, but uh, it works. Um, so here is uh, it's just a map of the migration of people based on carbon dating of remains that have been uh, found. So 200,000 years ago in Africa, moving west eastward. And the key thing here is you'll notice a pattern. The pattern is west to east, not east to west. And so 70,000 years ago through uh, the sub, um, Indian, Southeast Asia, Australia 50,000 years ago, then out through Melanesia, north through Micronesia into Polynesia, and then say 10, 12,000 years ago through the Americas. And what there is no evidence, no scientific evidence to demonstrate is that people would have migrated from east to west, so say South America into Polynesia. And hence, um, this is just a map of the, where you can see Australia and Papua New Guinea, and then again, a, a westward movement as it was branched out into Polynesia. Now, Tor Hardal in 1947 sailed the Kontiki. The Kontiki was a balsa log uh, raft, um, and that was a drift sail voyage. Key thing is it was drift sail, so he was not able to navigate that bolts a log raft. He was able to literally follow the currents, follow the winds. He did have a sail on it, but that sail was simply to help him with his uh, forward momentum. In 1969 and 1970, Tor then uh, uh, built the Ra 1 and then the Ra 2. The Ra 1 was a papyrus reed ship that he attempted to sail across the, uh, the Atlantic to the Caribbean from Africa. Uh, it broke up. Uh, he was unable to repair the boat due to sharks in the water. And then in, again, he followed up in 1970 with Ra 2, which was a success. And just uh, an interesting point that's relevant to today's plight that we all face is he had noticed in Ra 1 a lot of refuse in the water, a lot of oil clotting. So he had agreed with the UN that in 1970 he would conduct what is one of the first that I can identify through the, my readings, um, scientific study of the ocean pollution that we're all experiencing today. This is a meeting that I had with uh, Tor. There was a, just uh, four of us, the captain, my wife uh, today, and uh, a uh, cameraman that was on, on scene with us. We had a uh, pretty much about six to eight hours with Tor, had lunch with him. Um, the, the main purpose was to take his counsel and advice on how to construct the reed ship based on what he had done with uh, the papyrus, the raw expedition and just sought his, uh, his guidance in what to do, how to navigate it, etc. Interesting in Ra 1 and Ra 2, he told us firsthand, and you can read it in his books, that he was unable to sell the Ra 1 and Ra 2. Yes, it had, a, again, a sail on it, but it was a drift voyage. He just went with the currents and was unable to actually navigate it. Many times he said he was just drifting sideways and backwards with that, with that boat. So what is a reed? A reed is a piece of grass that grows in, uh, in and around waterways. Um, there's a, uh, they're found all over the world. People, I think, mostly identify papyrus reeds with the, with the reed species. However, these reeds are Totora reeds. They grow in and around uh, Lake Titicaca, but also up and along the west, uh, west coast of uh, South America. It takes about two and a half million of them to make what is the hull of the, uh, of the, the Viracocha II. Uh, it's a double hull, so you take those reeds, 
You bundle them in small bundles like that. You let them dry for a number of weeks. You then fashion them into long, what they literally refer to as sausages. And then you take a bunch of sausages, you make one of the two holes, and you do two of those. And then down the middle of the boat, and you can see literally running through the middle where you can see the boxes. Those boxes are for the center boards. And then there's a heart. There's a third bundle that's about a third of the size of one of the two holes. And then the rope goes around one hole and the heart all the way down one side. And you do the same thing on the other side. And then you pull those ropes tight. So it takes several weeks to dry the reeds. It takes several weeks to, to fashion them into these bundles. And then it takes several months in which to pull the ropes tight. And you literally just pull one rope at a time all the way down one side, you come back down the other side, you come back down that side, you come back, you just literally do it over and over and over again. The tighter the vessel, the less water it absorbs. It is a natural boat. It, there's no plastic, there's no metal uh, used to hold it together. It's only wooden dowels, rope, the reeds. Um, and essentially, it's a wash-through vessel. So if water comes on board, it just goes right out the bottom unless it actually holds and absorbs some of that water. And that's why you want the boat as tight as possible to keep uh, water from coming uh, into the boat. Now, one of the other uh, key features of it is around the two double holes, the uh, Amati Indians from Lake Titicaca who help us build the hull itself, they know the ancient techniques to do so. Um, they take a woven mat and wrap it around that hole before they put the rope on it. And that woven mat helps keep water from seeping into the boat or it certainly slows it down. And that's really, really important because if that gets damaged, you have a real problem. Now, following on the construction, once the hull is done, you can put the superstructure on it. This is the, um, the cabin frame being put up. It follows the mast that had already been put up. Now you can see the, the boat taking shape. The sails are a flax linen uh, cloth. Uh, made in uh, Peru. The cells are hand sewn together in, in stripes, then fashioned into the shape of a cell, painted, a bolt rope put in it and around it, and then uh, ultimately loaded up. This is one of the rudders. I'll come back to the rudders because you can just see the size and the scale, the weight of what we're dealing with. And if you have problems at sea, which we ended up having quite a number of them, um, trying to manhandle that at sea to repair it is quite difficult. So when we went to launch the boat, you would think, let's do this safely. So we tied a, uh, we put some, uh, literally some railroad uh, t um, rails underneath the boat. We lowered it down onto those rails, put some roller logs, and you can actually see some of the wood logs just there in front of the boat near the beach. And those, the boat then rolls down into the water. We tied a rope to our bow and the Chilean Armada who was assisting us tied a rope to their boat and they were to pull us gently across those first waves. Now, going into the Pacific from Viña del Mar where we launched and or where we built the boat and then launched it, um, the water gets really deep quickly. So when the waves come in, you can see it's quite calm and flat and, the, uh, and, and essentially we just needed to be pulled out a few kind of 20 or 30 meters and we would have been safe. However, the Chilean Armada tied a bad knot uh, the rope came undone on their end and essentially we turned port side and got pinned there on the beach and took those waves. So three years, uh, a strong sense of adventure, 250,000 US and it was over before we got started. Um, now I dove in and up at the top picture you can see a little person in the water. I uh, took a half inch sisal rope, uh, swam it out to the dinghy that's coming in the dinghy, I handed it to the uh, armada that was in that dinghy, fell into the boat because I was really, really tired, took five seconds, opened my eyes, and they had thrown the rope back into the water. I don't know why. So I then jumped back in the water and swam back to the boat, climbed in it, and by that time, as I was coming back to the boat, a guy named Jorge, who was a crew member, had swam out another half-inch sisal rope and tied it himself to the mooring buoy which was the tanker boy just offshore, probably 75 to 100 yards, and then we were able to uh, pull ourselves off. Now, if you notice, there's a, a guy in an orange jacket up at the top of the boat. He's sitting there. He was just a, from one of the local newspapers, thought he was gonna get a little ride, a little first-hand photo, 
And did he, did he get his money's worth? Um, I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but there are just a few little points that are worth uh, teasing out. First of all, we were to take 35 days uh, at, at, at sea. We were 75 days at sea. We were to depart on the red line, 20th of February, and we were to arrive on the 31st of March, the other red line. Um, we ended up leaving on the 17th of March, so two little triangles to the right. And then we actually announced that we were selling on the 22nd of March. We could not figure out how to sell the boat. On the 7th of May, or excuse me, let's look at the 7th of May, which is next to it. Um, there's an entry there in my journal where 10 days to the, to the point, we were in the exact same position. Because what this journey, as, as I go through and show you some photos of it, the pattern is, is that it's three days, very, very good winds, three days, no winds. The unfortunate thing is, is the closer you get into, get closer to May, uh, you get three days of good winds, three days of no winds, and then three days of counter winds. So you really had to make your way during those three days. And then on the 12th of May, uh, Tom uh, had to leave because he had received a phone call on the 2nd of May. And as you can see down at the bottom, uh, on the 22nd of March, Lily dumps Greg. May 2nd, Tom gets the call from his wife. And on May 18th, Karen dumps Felix. I had my own uh, uh, interpersonal challenges with my wife along that journey as well. So uh, yeah, exploration is not for everyone. So when we, when we uh, departed, um, after an, a week, 10 days of, of making repairs to the boat, and it's important, I mentioned the fabric it's on the outside of the boat. You can see that it looks like a, if those that have any sort of American trivia, it looks like a chia pet on the right hand side on the, on, the, uh, on the port side there. And that's where the waves pounded the boat and literally destroyed that sheathing on the outside. And you will see toward the end of the expedition, the boat is almost underwater on the left, on the port side as a result of that. So we get a tow about one to two miles off because leaving Chile at Viña del Mar, you're right beside Valparaiso. So there's a lot of, um, of uh, boat traffic. So we need to get uh, to, to the safety out of the, the shipping lanes. And then for the next five days, that's pretty much what it looked like. Staring at the compass, standing on the helm, figuring out what in the world are we doing wrong? Now, it, it does seem comical, right? I mean, there's a, a group of guys that are built to sell boat, trying to sell it, can't figure out how to actually sell the boat. Um, but you know, when you talk to Tor Haradol, he was like, we couldn't figure out how to sell it all the way across the Caribbean. We just drifted. Our challenge is, is we weren't drifting. We actually had to navigate and sell uh, into the wind across traver you know, traverse currents. Um, and it was pretty concerning when we couldn't get the boat to move. In the end, uh, and this is Tom who will be speaking next on, on some of his mountaineering exploits, but we had to literally take the platform that he's standing on and move it four feet to the back while at sea. We just had to rebuild it, um, and uh, that allowed us to, to sell. We just needed the rudders a little bit further back behind the cells in order to get grip. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, when we had to traverse the currents, when we left about right here, somewhere around there is Viña del Mar, and we were to come to Easter Island. The, the challenge is, is that you've got the Humboldt current ripping up along the west coast of South America, just pushing you straight north. And we had to actually cut across that. And then as you get to Easter Island, you're going really through the heart of the South Pacific gyre, which has vortex currents. And then to land on Easter Island, you actually have to navigate to it. Um, it is impossible, other than by just some one in a million chance, that you could drift sail to Easter Island. Because you would have to probably start well, I'm not even sure you could ever get there by drift sailing because the currents would just rip you so far north and you would miss it. So the reason that we wanted to get to Easter Island was to demonstrate that the craft could have been used, an ancient style craft could have been used to navigate purposefully to Polynesia versus a, uh, just a, a drift sail and by chance uh, voyage. This is a shot of in the interior of the cabin. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see bunks. There were three rows of two bunks each, and then there was a tent out in the front that, uh, that a couple of guys slept in. We had a crew of eight. Um, and on the left, you can see a picture of the cell, and the cell is backed. And what happens is when we got out of, uh, of about 30 degrees into the wind, um, the cell would back against the mast. And if we didn't rush to make that right, 
the yard, that wooden arm that you can see would break and you'd have to repair it. And really important was the, the fact that if it did break and you had good winds, you, lo you lose those days of, of good winds. This is a picture of uh, Stefan, um, who's uh, having a little rest on his bunk. You can just see it's quite tight quarters, but overall uh, a quite a comfortable uh, place to uh, seek retreat. This is the kitchen. Uh, you can see plenty of food there, the stacks of eggs, lots of bananas, uh, other vegetables. Um, the challenge is we had provisions for about 35 days, 75 days. We were on severe uh, rations by, by the end of it. This is just a picture and, and what I will do throughout the presentation is often show you a picture of before and kind of after. And this is the cupboards, the same cupboards that you can see here. You're looking now just a slightly different view of the kitchen but there is nothing there. We're literally taking stock to start going into what is severe rations around our uh, food supplies. There were plenty of wonderful days out there where you know you had calm seas and you could just sit there and enjoy yourself, a little relaxing shave in the sun and that's uh, Eric Ott. And then there were days where really all hands on deck had to hold, hold down the fort because all sorts of things would go wrong when we had uh, big, big swells like this. Um, I mentioned the cell backing. This is another, another day where it backed. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can actually see the yard where it actually snapped across the mast. We were not fast enough to get it off. And what that does is then requires three days of uh, repairing uh, the cells. But again, you would lose those good days. You'd get into some no winds, so we'd be stuck. And then, but we would really have some nice times at sea. Uh, and you can see on the right hand side that, uh, that you know, we found a lot of refuse every day. And at the time I was really ignorant to the whole issue of ocean pollution. This is back in 2003. But I did note every day we found a basketball, a soccer ball, a boy, a ghost net, a piece of uh, plastic of some sort, a Coke bottle one day floated by. Every day there was a piece of uh, refuse in what is one of the most remote areas of the ocean you can uh, voyage. And also we were just really interested in how the sea life attached to these objects. And you, you think from those that are marine scientists and how uh, you know, uh, fauna and animals could have migrated from one place to another by latching onto these, uh, uh, th this refuse, whether it was a palm tree or a basketball in this case, and, uh, and, and go into other uh, places. Um, this is the rudder again, as I mentioned. Um, so this is Jorge up in the left-hand corner ma uh, making the rudder. In the camp, uh, down on the left, we're taking it to the beach. You can see the size and scale of it. And then uh, in the, the right-hand side, what had happened was the, the, during some of those big waves, there was enough torque on that rudder that it actually spiral fractured, and we had to put some splints around it, pull it out of the water, and then re-rope it. And that is a very arduous thing to do uh, at sea. Very, very difficult. But again, you have no choice. If you don't have a rudder, you're not really going to go where you want to go, and certainly when you are forced to navigate to Easter Island. Uh, this is Tom again uh, in the kitchen doing what he does best, cooking up some good grub for us. And then afterwards uh, we would do the uh, duty. We would wash the dishes. The interesting thing about this is that we took about three or four sets of uh, utensils, cutlery. Um, what would happen, it didn't happen too often, but it happened often enough that uh, we had a problem at the end, which was you would do the dishes, your cutlery would be at the bottom, somebody would not be thinking would throw the water into the ocean and you would see the glittering of the forks and everything. It was really pretty actually, as it uh, would just glisten off into the distance. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, by the end of it, we had two spoons and that was it. And we were literally with bowls of, you know, hot water and some pasta in it, um, sharing a spoon. And I remember just, you know, rubbing it off of my shirt and you just get to a point where you just don't care. I just want to eat and get back to work. I always get a question uh, when I talk to, uh, to, to folks about this, about how did you go to the bathroom? Well, a picture says a thousand words. <laughs> this, uh, this day we had, um, again, great, well, uh, you know, pretty um, uh, stiff winds, which is fantastic. However, in this day, the sheet line, that rope that you can see holding the cell to the boat, came undone, or someone let go of it as we were changing cells. And it, uh, when it starts whipping like that, you cannot do anything but get out of its way. I promise you, if it hits you, it will kill you. If it hits you in the head, 
it would probably be instantaneous. If it hits your arm, it would snap it in half. So you can only stand back. What we would do is use a long bamboo pole or something and try to arrest it and, and get it in, or we would turn the boat into the wind so that we could then get the cell to fall to grab that rope. On this particular day, it was so such you know stiff winds that we were unable to get control of it, and it started shredding in front of our uh, eyes. And then literally the, the cell, just sheet by sheet, started um, ripping up its side. And so what does that mean? During those good wind days, the cells come down, and we're sitting there sell, uh, sewing the bolt rope back into the cell to get what we can and salvage what we can out of that particular cell. And uh, I mean, your fingers would bleed. It was, you know, it would take three days just to repair uh, that cell. This is another shot of Felix Fisher, uh, one of the gentlemen on the, on the crew with us, who was also taking his turn and doing some of the, uh, the sewing. And then that's the cell going back up on the left and then up uh, in full glory, uh, ripped in half. Uh, and what that meant is obviously then we move even slower when we have uh, good winds again. So what do we do? We become uh, you know, a, a bit ingenious about let's just manufacture something. So we put a jib up, but it wasn't a jib that we already had. So we pulled out the sewing needles again, took out some linen cloth, and we made a jib cell. Um, spent three or four days doing that, and that only increased our speed by a quarter of a knot which sounds like, why would you go through all that work? But when you multiply it by a month, quarter of a knot per hour, or even three months, all of a sudden it's worth every bit. That quarter knot is invaluable. This is a picture of us when we change the cells, you change your lee boards from one side to the other. So Tom and Eric Ott lifting them up, two other guys on the other side, grabbing them and putting them back into their slots. On the left, um, that uh, wahoo came up along the boat. Um, we didn't have fish too often. When we did have fish, we had too many. Um, but on this particular one, this fish was swimming along the boat. We couldn't stop the boat to, uh, to try to catch it. And so I shot it from standing on the boat with a, with a spear gun, which was pretty, pretty amazing at the time. Very lucky, um, but it was good eating. And then on the right-hand side, I want to back up from that picture. I'm going to tell you about that picture, but I want to back up about uh, two weeks. So I'd taken about 200 plastic lures to catch fish. None of them worked except for three, and they were all identical. It was a white and black tuna popper was the, what it was called. I'd already lost one, and I had two remaining, and we were fishing, and we had caught seven 50-pound tuna. We got into this massive school. It was midnight. There, were no, uh, there was no wind, and just one after the other pulling them in. What a fun time until you lose your second of three lures that is your sustenance. And I was like, Shh, you know, because what we had to do was six of those fish we had to throw back because you have nowhere to store them. We didn't take in salt, we didn't think about preserving fish, and I wouldn't know how to, I still don't know how to preserve fish anyway today. But nonetheless, we had to throw six of them back, cut the fish in half that we kept, eat as much as we could one day, the next day, and then throw it back uh, or throw the rest of it overboard. So I'd lost a lure having a bit of a jolly. The, about two weeks later, same situation, midnight, no wind, decide to go try to catch a fish. I catch a fish, but it takes that, uh, uh, the, the uh, what was I think the, I think I lost one. Anyway, took a, uh, the, the lure that I'd, I'd lost before, or, uh, one of the ones that were really important to us. It, the, and I was really disappointed, gutted. I did not fish anymore because I didn't want to risk it. The next day, 16 hours later, four o'clock in the afternoon, we still have no winds. I just swim off from the boat, 4,000 meters of water and over 50 mahi-mahi. And this was a very small one. This was about 37 pounds. There were a lot of bulls that were bigger than that. And they all came up to me and I was out there by myself and they just circled me. And I swam down three or four meters and it was right out of National Geographic, Disney, I'm not sure which, but it was a magical moment where these 50 mahi-mahi are just all around me, and I'm three or four meters down, and I'm just sticking my hand out as they just come schooling by, and I'm just touching one after the other. Magical moment. And then I saw my lure in the fish's mouth. <laughs> so I came back up to the surface and said, guys, get my spear gun, get my spear gun. I go swimming back. They hand me the spear gun. Now the spear gun was another vital means of, of food. And so I put the noose knot that I had tied to the gun around my wrist. But as only somebody from Alabama could do, I forgot to take my dive knife out. And so when I shot this fish, 
She wanted to go down. I didn't hit it in the head like I should have. She wanted to go down. I wanted to go up. And even with free diving fins on, I could not overpower the fish. And I was getting taken down. Luckily, Greg Dobbs was out there to, to watch this spectacle and swam down. And all I felt was arms go up under my, my armpits. I didn't even know anybody was out there with me and grabs me and we were able then to together fight that fish and it was a fight to get it back to the boat and we ate that fish got the lure back and caught more fish with that uh, with that lure so on the left um, we were passing isla de gomez uh, a island which is about 400 miles just northwest uh, no excuse me northeast of easter island it was the first piece of land that we saw probably seven 68 70 days into the voyage um, and it just looked like perfect conditions. We were under sail and I threw out a lure and caught that short billed spearfish. Very, very good eating. And on the right hand side, what is a snake mackerel? And it was a really important moment for us because we were really inspired as a lot of us were. They were on the boat by Tor Hardall. And when you look into his book on the Kontiki, he actually came across and first photographed the snake mackerel uh, on his voyage. And so to share kind of a moment with a particular species of uh, fish that he did was, uh, was special for us. And that's just a picture, it was a really odd looking uh, animal. Um, about in that same place, about 400 miles off Salia Gomez, I'm not sure how they would have ended up in the, you know, very, very deep ocean, but I can only presume that they would have been blown off the reef of Salia Gomez. And then because they had been molested the whole time by bigger fish, they just puffed up and just sat there and floated. And we thought they were just plastic balls in the water. So we uh, took, the, took the boat out and picked them up and then brought them back and uh, took a few photos and then just released them back into the wild. I'm not sure if it was really the most humane thing to do to put them back out there and let the mahi mahi molest them for the next, till they, anyway, you get the point. Um, again, days where no winds, um, we had a little bit of fun and did what uh, boys would do when you're out in the middle of the ocean. Probably not the safest thing in the world to do, but we were bored. And then all of a sudden the winds would pick up and the boat was just a beast to manhandle at times. And in this case, you got Phil Buck, the captain in the red and white jacket with a leg prying on the one, uh, getting leverage, holding onto uh, the rudder, gripping onto something else while another guy's using a rope to get some leverage on it just to get it into position. And that is uh, a lot of what we had to fight with. Now you don't do that sustainably, but you, once you get the rope locked into place, it would largely hold itself for hours on end, and then you'd have to make uh, adjustments. And then if you did have big, big seas, big winds, that was what we had to deal with. Now, I'm gonna ask that Tom give us a little bit of a, or a couple of minutes on this. I think it's a real privilege that we've got uh, myself being able to talk to the reed ship, but having two people that were actually on the boat and, and Tom then talking about his first uh, love, which is uh, the mountains. But nonetheless, we had a thief in the middle of the night as we were running out of food, who was actually going into a locked bag, taking the sweets. Um, yes, you, you, if you've, well, you put me on uh, mutiny on, in the, on the bounty and I read that and now I can believe that shit like that can happen. But uh, nonetheless, we, what we did was divvy up the sweets and pass them all out. And we literally just protected our own at that point. And then you ate what you, you ate. And Tom was the guy that we trusted the most. And so uh, Tom got the uh, pleasure of divvying them up. Do you want to just say a few words on that? On the expedition, the candy was so valuable. So we'd wake up in the morning and we'd do a, a little accounting of it. And we noticed that two or three pieces were gone. And it's a, it's a violation, like something very bad is taking place on the voyage. So we decided, I think we called this Easter Sunday, even though I don't believe it was Easter Sunday, we divvied up all the candy. And uh, the guy who we know was stealing all the candy, after I divvied them up, he had finished his, I, and 15 minutes later he was done. He was done. And then we took days and days and days, and it was our power, you know. So finally we got our our one-upmanship mm. over this guy. Anyway, it was a lot of fun doing that. Thank you, Tom. And uh, you know, one of the things we also had to ration at the end was toilet paper. And uh, I've still got the, the few sheets that I'd saved till the very end, but it's amazing what one little square of toilet paper will do. Even to this day, yeah, even to this day, going into the bathroom when you pull down and it rolls down, it's like, man, what a luxury because <laughs> And I'll do it again, just like, oh shit, this is so good. 
you know, but it's that we would use one square because that's all we had. And we got down to a point where we were out of pretty much everything, um, uh, including uh, toilet paper. Now, as I mentioned, Tom uh, got a call. He had to, to leave the uh, expedition. Uh, this is our last little team photo before we, uh, we departed with Tom. Now, as much as we loved Tom, as much as we trusted Tom, there's a silver lining in everything. And every man has his value. So when the boat came to pick him up, we got him to bring a couple of grocery sacks of food in exchange. Unfortunately, they only brought two grocery sacks. We were hoping that they were you know, a cargo ship, bringing provisions to Easter Island. There could at least been a pallet involved. They gave us two grocery sacks full of food. Uh, but let me tell you something, Tom, it was worth every bit to see you go, mate. So yeah. thank you. Now, Captain on the left, he, uh, had, we had taken three big uh, containers of uh, propane. One of the guys on the boat decided that with the fish vertebrae that we had been through the fish was taking them out and boiling them for hours, trying to be able to make necklaces using the little, the, the backbones and stuff. I mean, bizarre stuff, really. Can't make this stuff up. And nonetheless, I kept telling Captain, please, we need to stop this because if we don't stop, boiling that we're going to run out of propane. <laughs> we got plenty of propane. Okay. Well, what happens if we run out? Just, I mean, hypothetically. He says, well, I've got a, a camping grill. You know, I'm a mountaineer, right? And it's not Tom, by the way. I'm a mountaineer. I've got a, I want one of these camping grills. I said, okay, can you make it work? Because ones I know don't work very well. He says, no, I'm, I'm really good with it. You know, I've climbed all these mountains. Okay, good. Do you have enough fuel for it? Yo, we got more kerosene than we'll ever need for it. Oh, great. You know where this is going. On the right hand side, by the end of the last week and a half, we're cutting up wood and burning it on a reed, a grass boat, in order to boil water to put the pasta in it because all that stuff that we had just talked about came to fruition. We ran out of propane, the camping grill didn't work, it did work, we ran out of fuel when it did, and we ended up uh, cannibalizing uh, the, the boat. Though it does come to an end, and we reached Easter Island. And unfortunately though, as much as we wanted off that thing, and by the way, I swear I'd never get on another one when I, when I saw Easter Island, um, was that the, uh, we, we got there about six o'clock in the evening, sun was setting, and it would have been too dangerous to try to make a night landfall, so we downed cells and literally just had to sit there our last night. And that's our last milk. We had caught a, a wahoo, made a fire. It was beautiful, beautiful moment. That is a, a picture of the back of the boat uh, at the end. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side how it is listing to the port side, uh, and that is due to the damage that it had sustained early on. The right-hand side was still well, well out of the water, uh, and you know, one of the questions we were speaking last night in Melbourne, one of the questions was, you know, how far could the boat have gone? I don't know. We, we would have gone further if we thought the boat was seaworthy enough to do so. I don't know how far it could have gone, but it could have gone a hell of a lot further if we hadn't had the, uh, the problem with the launch that we had had. And that's just uh, the picture to show you just the significance of the listing. So this is exaggerated based on the, the rocking. So it would rock and it would go a little bit further than this, but that was due to the heavy weight on the port side and therefore just tanking it every time we caught a wave. When we get to Easter Island, I don't know the, the uh, lady's name that uh, sailed around the world, the 16 year old, uh, what was her name? Je Jessica? Yeah, so Jessica Watson. So, you know, when she came into Sydney Harbor, right, with the flotilla and, I mean, prime time, what a big event. I thought we would get something like that. Maybe, maybe it was two boats or something, but we got nothing but the immigration authorities coming out. And we, <laughs> this was our welcoming crew. And um, I was hoping that we would be able to get off the boat when they pulled this guy up wearing a full, uh, you know, hazmat uh, kit. And they said, no, you've got to stay on the boat. And then they fumigated us and, uh, and the boat. So hopefully there's no lasting effects of that. So that's the uh, expedition. I would like just to say that, you know, the, for me, life is about exploration. It's an inner exploration as much as it is an outer exploration. So the reed ship was that externalization of an internal journey. Um, I, I have come to realize that there is much more uh, in life than just accumulation, that it is about how do we generate, how do we give, 
And so one of the things that, uh, that Tom and I are looking at and I'd like to lead is another reed ship expedition, which is to bring awareness and attention to ocean plastics, ocean pollution. And we're looking to do that and start building it in January of 21, so in a year's time, and then look to set sail in January of 22. So please follow along. Um, it's early day uh, planning, but it is taking shape. Thank you very much for your time.